sometimes that's the hardest thing is to get off the line. So, uh, but I'm sure mom was awful proud, right? Where'd, where'd you go? There you are back there. Awful proud of your daughter. Um, we'd asked, uh, we, we called up or uh, emailed, I guess, um, her uh, beginning of the week and said, hey, we got some time this week if you want to uh, give us, uh, shoot us a quick little FaceTime video thing. And uh, so she was able to do that. And we just want to make you aware of those uh, that are uh, serving the Lord around the world uh, and what they're going through. So we heard from Todd a couple of weeks ago, Todd Kincaid and, the, and his wife. And now we get to hear from Julie today and, and Brian and Meyer are here too. So uh, we'll, we'll hear from them, I'm sure soon, but there, things are going well with you guys. You're getting back to, back to going and everything. So yeah, all right, well, good. It's good to see you guys here this morning as well. So, you know, Venice Bible Church, even though we're not large in numbers, uh, we do have an impact across the world. And that's because of those that, that have, a lot of them have been a part of this church and who have been sent out from this church and whom we still support. You know, one of the things I think about when I think of missionaries, I think about people who have not compromised in any way. In fact, they're willing to put it all on the line, all on the line and go. And so as I think about some of these folks that are, that are especially locked down in some of these countries that uh, can't get out. And we, you know, I, I think of my, just so you know, we have tried trying to get a hold of my, uh, we're trying to get an update on her. We just haven't heard from her. Uh, and pretty much the missions organization said that if you haven't heard anything from her, then everything is good. So we would like to hear more than that, but we're trying. So you can continue to pray for my, continue to pray for a lot of those. Uh, if you haven't heard, the, the Norths are coming uh, off the field uh, now and are in Georgia. And so we hope to hear from them in the next month or so. I'd like to see them come down and just kind of share, you know, their exit and then what they're doing in their exit plans and things as well. So uh, just so you know, missionaries, do you ever want to know anything about our missionaries at all? You can call the church office. We'll send you the newsletters that come in. Or you can call uh, Sue as well, or you can get a hold of them personally. Brian's not that far away. Go visit Brian. So he, he'll put you up. So uh, he, he might send you out. You might be careful with that. He might send you out. So, uh, but here we go. As we look at what no compromise means to us as a church today, we are um, looking at being fully committed being fully committed to the gospel and to what God has for us. And I'm so excited about this particular passage, as I am every week. It seems like the more you get into the Word of God, the more excited you can get by what He's doing and what He continues to do. But let me review quickly what we looked at last week, because in Colossians chapter 2, as we found last week, that we are living encouragement. And in verses 1 through 7, Paul says here, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those that lay out a sea and for all who have not met me personally. Paul says in verse two, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love and so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. He says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I tell you this so that no one would be able to deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in the body, I'm present with you in spirit. And I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and build up in him, strengthen in the faith. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So last week, as we looked at it, we saw that we are called to encourage. We said we are called to encourage. Paul said his goal was to, that the, the church would be encouraged in heart. The word was parakaleo as we looked at that, that they would be encouraged in heart. You see, Paul wanted the believers in Colossae to know their hearts were knit together in purpose and in ministry. And as Paul was encouraged, I believe we are called to the ministry of encouragement as well. In fact, if you remember right, last week we encouraged you to go to our website and click on that little tab and find a place where you could fill out a note of encouragement to someone. 
Now, I'm going to ask you, how many of you had the wonderful opportunity to do that this week? Raise your hands. Nice and awesome. You guys get stars for today on the way out. But I want to encourage you, if we're going to be a church of encouraging people, we need to look for ways to encourage. And so many times, I don't know about you, but I still have notes that my mom and dad have sent me over the years. Don and I have a drawer full of uh, birthday cards and anniversary cards and notes because the written word means something. In fact, every time my wife would write uh, or give a birthday card to one of our kids, I had very uh, almost enough room to sign my name because she would fill both sides completely with encouraging words to my kids. I finally had to say, hey, leave me some room so that I can encourage my kids as well. And you know what? I know that uh, some of our kids have, have kept some of those notes over the years, but there's something about, Dave is so good at writing cards. There is something about an encouraging word that is written in somebody's handwriting. Now, I know you can't do that online, but you can sign your name to that, and we'll make sure we get those to the people that you are trying to encourage. So we would like for you to do that for us. And, and I, we're going to do this for, the, for another two or three weeks, maybe four weeks, because eventually what we want to do is we want to put these all together and just put them on a big board, put them in our office so that whenever you come to our office, you would see this board full of encouraging comments to the body of Christ here. We are called to encourage. And so we're going to encourage you to continue to do that. Another one of goal, uh, the goals of Paul was that the church would join or would stride together, that they would unite together in unconditional love. That word was agape, in unconditional love. You see, Paul's goal was that a church would know Jesus intimately. He wanted them to know Jesus without a shadow of a doubt, to know him int intimately. We found out last week also that we are committed to stand firm in the faith. We are being challenged by Paul to stand firm in the faith. Last week we found that in Jesus we are all, there are all of the Father's resources stored up in Jesus. All of his wonderful, precious resources are stored, stored up in Jesus. All of his divine wisdom, all of the Father's knowledge. As we looked at that, the word was gnosis. We talked about that a little bit last week as well. Paul's goal was to know the word thoroughly. And not only for him to know the word for thoroughly, but for those whom he was teaching to know the word of God thoroughly. Our goal should be the same. You see, in knowing the word thoroughly, we are not deceived. When you truly know God's word intimately and thoroughly, you will not be deceived. You will not be let, misled by persuasive speech. That's what Paul was talking about. That's what was happened with the Gnosticism that was present in, the, in that time and in that church. You see, we are able to stand firm in our faith. And that word stand firm is only used right there in the New Testament in Colossians chapter 2, verse 5. That's the only place it's used. And it says we cannot be moved because we know Jesus and we do not compromise because of who he is. And the third point last week was that we are challenged to walk thankfully. We are challenged to walk thankfully by faith. We receive Jesus by faith. We give him total control by faith. We trust Jesus in every aspect of life lived of every place, of everything that we walk, of the life that we go through. Our goal then is to live Christ's life faithfully. That's what we found out last week, looking for opportunities to be rooted, to be grounded, to be firmly planted, looking for those opportunities, whether it be through DVD instructions or videos or online with YouTube or going to the church service or being involved in a, in a Bible study or in a, a ladies group or a men's group. We're looking for ways and looking for opportunities to be grounded. One of our goals for this next fall is that we'll be able to get back maybe to some men's and women's studies during the week, that we'll be able to, to, to lead in that using the facility that we have now, to be able to, be able to get back to a Sunday school class, uh, make sure our home groups are meeting together, together again. So we look for ways and opportunities to be rooted firmly, to be grounded, to be established in him, looking for ways to be built up in our purpose and in our confidence 
We are thankful, we found out last week as well, thankful beyond measure. We are, our, and our thankfulness cannot be contained. Have you ever been around a thankful person? It is contagious. You ever been around a smiling person? It is contagious. Have you ever been around a grumpy person? You don't want to go back. <laughs> but our goal is to be thankful. Our goal is to be all about who Jesus is. The goal of Venice Bible Church then is to become known as a thankful and encouraging body of believers where people are just dying to get here. Uh, there's no compromise in our beliefs and we will walk the walk of encouragement. That was last week, pretty full week. But today, as we look at verses six through 10, we're gonna kind of look at six and seven again, very briefly, and then move on through verse 10. But today, I just wanna read that whole thing and try to keep us in, in context with what Paul is talking about. So as we read Colossians 2, if you got your Bibles, get them out. Uh, if you got it on your phone, get it out so that you can follow along with me. We're reading out of the NIV, but as we do, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to pour into your word, to learn from you, to allow your Holy Spirit to indwell as he indwells us, to teach us uh, th these things concerning you. So we give this time to you, Father. Thank you for the opportunity we have to learn and grow in you. In your name we pray, amen, amen. So Colossians 2, verses 6 through 10 says this. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through a hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental for spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and over every authority. The word in Christ is mentioned some, or in him, is mentioned some six times in these few verses here. I think he wants us to understand that everything we do, everything that we are is in Christ and he is in us. So our first point this morning as we look at it is this. When we are fully committed to live in Jesus, there will be no compromise in our faith. When we are fully committed to live our lives in Jesus Christ, a full commitment, there's not going to be a compromise in our faith because Christ is the center of our commitments. See, as we look a little deeper into Colossians chapter 2, in verses six and seven, let me just read that again. So then just as you have received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Just as you received Jesus, how do we receive him? By faith. We didn't receive him by works. It wasn't anything that you could have done to receive him. But as you received him by faith, in other words, just as you have intellectually understood who he is through the written word, through the teaching of others, just as you, you have in your mind understood him to be Lord, him to be master, him to be uh, the, having absolute ownership rights over you, then live your life in him. Walk in accordance with him. Walk hand in hand. Walk step by step with the master. Walk step by step with the master. Allow him to guide. Allow him to direct each and every step that you make. As you grow, don't become independent. Trying to do it yourself. See, one of the flaws with with us being human, is that we always want to grow and be independent, right? You're a teenager. You want to be independent. You don't want mom and dad telling you what to do any longer. We always want to get to gain that place of independence. But we realize as we get older that we are never truly independent, are we? There is always somebody telling us what we can and cannot do. Amen, right? And if 
you don't listen to those in authority, what happens? You suffer the consequences, right? You suffer those consequences from not doing that. You see, when we are in Christ, we don't want to grow independent. We want to grow in our dependency on him because we realize that doing it on our own is foolishness and it will lead to failure and it will lead to broken hearts and broken dreams and all kinds of broken stuff. All you got to do is look at the world today to see that. Those who live independent of Christ. We need to rely on him even more. We need to become rooted in him. We need to become firmly established. Second Timothy chapter two and verse 15 says this, do your best to present yourself to God. Do yourself to offer yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. You see, we are called to be built up in him. We are called to follow the master's plan. That's literally what that word to be built up in. It means to follow the plan, to follow the master's plan as we read his word. And you know, he has designed a plan for each one of us. And if you want to know a little bit more about that, go ahead and maybe sometime this afternoon, I was going to do it this morning, but I think maybe go ahead this afternoon and read Psalm 139. And what does David say in Psalm 139? He says, oh, Lord, you've, you've seen me before and behind. You've dipped me in. You, you understand me. You know, when I, when I stand up, when I wake, when I, when I go to sleep, you know everything about me. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. All your works are wonderful. I know that full well. That's what David was coming to realize. He came to realize that God had a perfect design for him. And his design for us is a perfect design. He has designed each one of us with specific gifts and with specific abilities, not to sit on the couch at home, but to be used by him wherever we go. You see, God has called us to do what he has called us to do. And it looks different in each one of us. That is the beauty about the body of Christ. Because what I do looks different from what you do. And God uses each one of us as he sees fit. You see, Donna, God created me and Donna so much, so different. I'm not a real good hospital visitor. Once I get there, I'm okay, but I'm good with her. Because when we go into a hospital together, a hospital room together, and we go there to pray over somebody, to, to just to be there for somebody, she always leads the way. I never, I can't go in first. And if you've ever been visited by Donna and my, myself, she'll come up to you and she'll put her hand on your hand and she'll rub your shoulder and she, she will just go and touch you, make you feel like you are somebody. And I wait for her lead because God did not gift me that way. I am nervous as all get out about going to a hospital. I hate going to hospitals by myself because I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. But with her, God loosens that up in me because she breaks the ice. And then I am able to share the gospel. I'm able to pray. I'm able to come alongside. Without her, man, I am useless. And all the ladies said, amen, right? <laughs> but we are gifted so differently. And God uses us so differently. And he desires to use us. And that Paul says, we have been designed by him for these specific works. We have been strengthened in the faith. We have been confirmed. We have been secured. We have been established. In fact, Paul says we are on this solid ground, walk on this solid ground. I love Psalm 40. It says this, I've waited patiently for the Lord. He turned and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit and out of the mud and the mire. And he set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him because they see what he has done in you and I. That is what is attractive for the church. He established it, we, and we need to be established in the faith. Hebrews 11 says this. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Faith 
is confidence in what we hope for. Not I hope so. I hope I win the lottery. I hope I win a million dollars. That's not what he's talking about here. Hope is based on the person of Jesus Christ. So faith is the confidence that we hope for, that of Jesus Christ. That hope is based on the promises of the Father. So faith is being confident that the Father will do what he has promised. Did you hear that? Faith is being confident that the Father will do just exactly what he has promised. And then, and only then, I can overflow with thankfulness, not because of what I am, but because of who I am in him, because of what he has already done. You see, because I am being strengthened, because I've been built up or rooted up and I am living with Christ as my life, I am secure in his riches, in his wealth. My hope is firmly grounded in the Father's word and I have an assurance of all that he has done and has yet to do in me through me, for me. I have full assurance in him, even though I have not seen. Because faith goes beyond what is seen. Even though I have not seen, I can still be absolutely confident because of who I believe in. Because of who I believe in. And I can overflow with thankfulness. I can overflow with all the thankfulness that he is. I can continue to walk in grace and I continue to walk in Jesus point number two today when we are fully committed to walk in grace when we are fully committed to walk in grace there will be no compromise in our beliefs when we are fully committed to walk this walk of grace there's no compromise because we begin to understand what grace is and there is no compromise to our beliefs, you see, you don't have to balance God's grace. <laughs> so many people want to balance his grace, but we don't have to balance his grace if we truly understand what his grace is all about. In Colossians 2.8, as we continue this passage today, Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow or deceptive philosophy. It depends on human tradition and the elemental spirit, spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Let me just say this, if we are firmly established, if we are rooted, and if we have been following the Father's blueprints, the Father's plans, then we will not be taken captive. <laughs> you will be free. You will not be taken captive, not in spirit, not in your identity, not in who you are. We will not be enslaved by that which has no foundation, that which is meaningless, that which elevates human tradition, it was what it says, over biblical truth, which is legalism. We won't be enslaved by that. You see, the opposite of grace is legalism. That's when we start putting more faith in our experiences, when we start putting more faith in our traditions than we do in the word of God. That's when we start saying, instead of this is what God's word says, we say things like, were well, our bylaws that say this? I'm sorry, wait, did I just say that? You know, there's so many times when we refer to man's written documents rather than to God's written word. That is when we enter in to this thing called legalism. Legalism sidetracks. Grace focuses on Christ. Grace clarifies the truth. Legalism enslaves. Well, you need to wear a certain thing because if you don't, grace frees. Grace frees us to worship. Legalism kills. I've seen it happen over and over again. People leave the church because of legalism, oftentimes. Grace gives life. When he talks about the traditions of men, they can be awesome, right? There are some awesome traditions that are out there today. College football that's going to happen this fall is an awesome tradition, right? <laughs> <laughs> I 
There are some good traditions of men. <laughs> but <laughs> there are times when we let the traditions of men overwhelm us. Traditions can hold us back from growing spiritually. We get so wrapped up in, you know, oh, oh wait a minute. Are we going to start with songs today? Or are we going to start with a prayer? Are we going to start with the message maybe? And if we reorder the service this morning, how many people are going to be blown away and not be able to worship? Are we so entrenched in our legalistic traditions that we're not able to fully comprehend and experience who God is? I sat under a pastor one time and for communion every, every month, he would say the exact same words in the exact same tone inflection in the exact same way. And as the associate pastor of that church, I went to him one time and I said, can we change up communion a little bit? It's getting kind of dry. And he was offended. But it was the same exact thing every week. I want to do things that are different. I want to see God work in new ways and exciting ways. Sometimes traditions are wonderful. We all have a tradition. Most of us have a tradition at Thanksgiving time. We, we eat a turkey. That's a wonderful tradition. Any tradition that has to do with food is a wonderful tradition, right? Especially in my house, we fry a turkey. I don't just fry one. We usually fry two or three. You know, there are human traditions that are wonderful. But once they sidetrack us from God's word and who he is, that's when it leads into legalism. Traditions can hold us back from growing spiritually. The test is always biblical. Does this particular tradition hold value, hold face in the word of God? Is its or origin based on who God is? And we need, to make, we need to be very careful that we do not make tradition equal to God's word. Be careful that you don't do that. And see, and when he talks about the elemental spiritual forces, the Gnostics, they believe that angels and heavenly bodies influenced people's lives. Sounds to me like they were basing their lives on astrology. <laughs> These are traditions. They were traditions that many of them, the Greeks, grew up with. They were basing their lives on these things. And they were being spiritually sidetracked. The believers in Colossae were being sidetracked from what was truly of God. You see, and Paul was trying to bring them back. What they had been taught was being compromised. Sound familiar? We saw this last week in verse 4 where it says, I tell you this, that no one may deceive you so by fine-sounding arguments. See, the basic principles of this world are hollow and they are deceptive. Where are we compromising our faith? Maybe the question is, are we compromising our faith in any way? We need to examine what well, we do. We need to hold it up to the word of God and let God's word shine the light on what we do, what we say, how we behave. See, we need to walk in grace. As we walk in grace, we find that Jesus is our foundation. We find that he is our cornerstone. And finally, this morning, in our third point today, we, when we are fully committed to the authority of the Father, in verse 9 and 10, there will be no compromise to our surrender to the Son. We will be fully surrendered to Him when we are fully committed to the Father's authority and who He is. See, Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10 say this, For in Christ, there it is again, for in Christ, you and I are in Christ, and in Him all the authority of the Godhead in fact, it says that all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So in him is all of the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And you and I <laughs> have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In Christ, all the fullness. In Christ, the sum total. In Christ, all of the superabundance of the deity dwells in bodily form. Everything. 
when Jesus was walking the earth, as Jesus died on the cross, as Jesus rose again, in him was fully God. All of his riches, all of the treasures, all of his wisdom, all of his knowledge was in Christ, the Godhead. And it was only used once here in Colossians 2, 9. I like those times when you find these words only being used once and the importance that they play, are placed, uh, that Paul places on these words here. So in Christ, the Godhead is revealed personally. In Christ, the Godhead is revealed relationally. And in Christ, the Godhead is revealed in his fullness. In Christ, we live. We find our permanent dwelling in him. We settle down as him being our permanent residence. And you know, he settles in us having us as his permanent residence as well. Because we are in him and he is in us. In Christ, we are home. And I think about where we are here. We have a gym that we're meeting in. It's a borrowed gym. And it's a wonderful place because the air is on <laughs> and the lights are there. And we can spread out with our body. We can practice this thing of social di distancing in our body. And we can invite more people. In fact, if you want to come to church, we can invite more people and still experience the distancing that we need to do. But this is not our home. This is the home for Christ. And I am in him and he is my home as well. And we get into chapter three. Oh my goodness, I can't wait till we get to chapter three. You're gonna have to come back for that one because we find that we are in him and he is in us and we are there together. We are in the heavenly places, but yet we are, oh man, there's so much good stuff going on here that Paul is trying to help us to understand. In Christ, we have been brought to fullness. Because in him is all the fullness of the Godhead. And we are in him and he is us. So in him, we experience all of God's fullness as well. That ought to make you shout. You ought to become a little Pentecostal over that one. Right? Can I hear an amen? amen. There we go. Good. Let me sure you're awake. In Christ, we've been brought into fullness. We have been made complete in him. We have been filled to the individual capacity of which he can fill us too. We've been completely filled up, some of us more than others. But we have been filled up in Him. As the Son is filled with the Father, we are filled with the Son. We find out in His verses that Jesus is our head. He is our cornerstone. He is over everything. He holds everything to, together. Without Him holding it together, it could not be held together. He created all. I don't know how many of you saw the space shuttle launch or the whatever that was called yesterday, but it was the X something, whatever. But we, you know, coming from, you know, 20 years ago, we called it the shuttle. It went up in the air. And I'm thinking as you saw those beautiful pictures, best pictures I've ever seen. Remember watching some of those launches 20 years ago? We didn't have high def back then. And this high def, man, it was beautiful to seeing all those things. And as we experienced that, I couldn't help but think of the creation of God that far ext extends where we are right here and now and the beauty of his creation. You see, he is the head over everything. He is the cornerstone. He holds. I couldn't help but think that he, as he, that he has to hold this planet, this earth, this solar system, this galaxy, everything out there. He holds it together. Without him being there, it would fly apart. He holds the little parts and he holds the big picture at the same time because he realizes that the little parts are just as important as the big picture. You and I are little parts, but we are part of the big plan for God. We are part of his big picture, not only here in Venice, but in Paris, France. And last week or a couple of weeks ago in Rome, in Tampa, and as they go out and send people out to the other regions of the world, God holds all of this 
together. We are all little parts of the big picture, and he understands how we all fit together to accomplish his purpose. How we all fit together to accomplish his purpose. See, Jesus is over every power. Jesus is over every rule. Jesus is over every beginning or origin of everything. Jesus is over every virus. Jesus is over every authority that has been delegated. And he has delegated the authorities. He is over all of those things. You see, things like Minnesota should not be a surprise to us. Really shouldn't. Because we have kicked God out of lives. We have ignored Jesus in lives. And you and I, our responsibility is to give people the one who can save them, the one who can rescue them, the one who can smooth over racial indifferences, the one who can be the healing balm in a city. It is all about him. See, we're, Minnesota shouldn't be a surprise. It is simply man operating without Christ. Riots shouldn't be a surprise to us either. It is simply man operating without Christ. The blame game, the conspiracy theories, they shouldn't be a surprise either. Simply man operating without Christ. You see, so we wrap this up this morning when we are fully committed to live in Jesus. There will be no compromise in our faith. And when we are fully committed to walk this walk of grace, to live this life of grace, there will be no compromise in our beliefs. And when we are fully committed to the authority of the Father, the authority of the Scriptures, the authority of the written Word, there will be no compromise in our surrender to the Son. We will surrender without compromise. See, that's where we are this morning. So our question for us today is in light of the things that are going on in this world, how do we respond to the Father's incredible grace? He has been so good to us. I love this. We live in such a way that others begin to question what is going on in that head of ours, right? Why are you doing what you're doing? Let's pray. So, Father, here we are. We are in you. You are in us. You are over every power, every authority, every rule. And, Father, as we become more and more fully committed to you, may you use us in such a way that Venice will never be the same. Florida would never be the same. This United States would never be the same. This world would never be the same because of our commitment to you, because there is no compromise in our beliefs. Father, you are our foundation. You are our cornerstone. You are our life. And may we see you for who you really are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Let's sing together.